Hello, my name is Kip Balkum. I'm a research agronomist in National Soil Dynamics Lab located in Auburn, Alabama. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk to you about cover crop management and specifically how it relates to biomass production. I think this is important for two reasons. One is if a grower is going to take the time to invest in a cover crop and plant the cover crop, we want to ensure that we manage that cover crop in a way that will be beneficial for the grower. The second reason is just simply cost. Cover crops are not free, so we want to ensure that we utilize those resources as effectively as possible for the cover crop. Okay, I talked to you guys, I mentioned about uh, the cost of cover crops, and I want to share with you a budget related to rye, uh, which is obviously a popular cover crop that we utilize in the southeast. This just gives you an idea about some of the cost that we utilize in our experiments uh, at the Soil Dynamics Lab. And obviously the numbers can vary a little bit, but I think it's generally going to be uh, in line with what most people would be considering in a cover crop budget. The first thing is you obviously have your seeding cost, um, and you can see here we're at 25 cents a pound for cereal rye, and we applied 90 pounds to the acre. So that's a little bit higher seeding rate. You're going to have to have a trip across the field. In this case, we used a no-till drill to plant the uh, cover crop, but it could be you know, with a, a broadcast or ever how you want to do it. Uh, in this case, we also fertilize the cover crop. In general, we don't have a lot of free nitrates in our soils, so we uh, usually put a little bit of nitrogen to the cover crop, particularly a cereal, to enhance the biomass production. In this case, we're talking about 30 pounds, and that's another application uh, trip across the field. Now, we also have to terminate the cover crop, and this can be done chemically and in combination with a, a mechanical termination as well. And I have that highlighted on here. We're just using glyphosate, we have an application cost, and we like, obviously we like to roll it down because we want to see a nice mat on the soil surface. Um, so when you take a look at this, it totals up, we're talking about $57 an acre roughly for that cover crop. So that gives you an idea of how much this costs and you can relate that to your operation. Now what can, what do we have control over on this budget that we can actually uh, change? Now, we don't have any, any say over how much the seed actually costs, but we certainly can make up our mind as to how much seed we want to plant. So there's something that we can vary uh, up or down to uh, influence our bottom line there. Obviously, fertilization. We don't have any control over the, um, how much nitrogen costs, but we can certainly either not apply any, or in some cases, we might want to apply more to enhance the biomass production even further. And there's really nothing else. I mean, you could make an argument that you want to eliminate a mechanical termination. You don't want to lay it down, so you subtract off a little bit of money there. But those are the main things that we can control. The only other thing I think that we have influence over that's not reflected in this budget is when we plant the cover crop. Now, I realize that climate plays into that, so we don't, we don't have 100% control over that, but we certainly have some say over when we're going to plant our cover crop. In light of these various factors, we wanted to design a study that would look at how that influences biomass production. We're actually in the fourth year of a six-year experiment where we're looking at planting dates for rye that range from mid to late October to early mid-December. Then we have two different seeding rates for the rye, 60 and 90 pounds, and also we uh, applied nitrogen to the cover crop from zero up to 90 pounds per acre. And as I said, this is the fourth year of the study, and I want to summarize what we have so far, the results so far from this study. You can see uh, the first thing is we're looking at that average biomass production for each one of the planting dates reflected across the nitrogen rates that were applied. The first thing I want to point out is if you notice, we had the average of a 60 and 90 pounds of seeding rate. We did not have any differences associated with 60 or 90 pounds, so we were able to just average that together. Now that's obviously a benefit because if we can get by with 60 pounds of seed as opposed to 90, we just lowered that bottom line cost, which is gonna help us uh, with the cover crops. Now the next thing is you can see uh, the differences in the planting dates. And as you would expect, the earlier planting date, this blue line, mid to late October, produced the most biomass over all the nitrogen rates. And, that, and then the biomass levels begin to separate down from that. And with the latest planting date, the early mid-December, producing the lowest amount of biomass. And you see also, we did see some response uh, to the nitrogen. You see a, an increase in the slope, 
for each one of the planting dates. So to be honest with you, this is not uh, something that was terribly surprising. We kind of know this, but the whole goal was how can we develop guidelines for growers that plant their cover crops late? Is there something they can do to enhance biomass production when they're not able to plant it as early as, as we would like? And unfortunately, if you look at this, let's look at this red line, the early to mid-December date. You can imagine if someone planted that, that late, they applied 90 pounds of seed to the acre as, as their rye for the rye, and they applied 90 pounds of nitrogen to the acre, and you can see what level of biomass they produce. And if you follow that across, they're basically about the same level as if they'd have just planted it early and didn't apply any nitrogen fertilizer. So you can see the cost savings. Uh, it costs a lot more money to produce this amount of biomass than it did to just plant it early. So that's something to certainly be aware of when we think about trying to enhance biomass production. Planting early is a critical aspect to enhance biomass. Now, the one thing is this is an average of all four years of the study so far, but cover crops are just like cash crops. We have some years, for example, you may have a good cotton year, you may have a good peanut year, et cetera. Well, unfortunately, the same thing happens with cover crops. They don't always perform as well as we would like every single year. Uh, and I wanna show you examples of that. This, these two years, rep, this represents 2015 and 2017, and it's the same graph I just showed you. It's just those two years. You can see uh, these would be what I consider the normal years. Uh, we have we still get the separation with the early planting date and, and the others did not separate out as much as I would have thought, but it definitely favors the early planting date. So you can see a little bit more slope, a little bit more responsive to the nitrogen. Um, and you also see here for the example I talked about, you get a little bit more biomass produced compared to that zero planted at early in, in mid to late October. But it sh gives you an idea of what kind of limitations you have when you plant as late as mid, early mid-December. Now, some of the other years uh, were totally different. 2016, uh, you can see how it, we saw no response to nitrogen in this year. And this was actually a year where we had a tremendous amount of rainfall in the fall. Uh, this was an El Nino year. We received about 11 inches of rain in November, and we basically lost all the nitrogen that had been applied uh, for some of these other, other planting dates. And you can see there's no, everything is flat. There's no response to nitrogen. You still see a little bit of benefit for planting early, but we didn't see uh, any benefit to nitrogen. And of course, uh, our previous research has shown that fall applied nitrogen is beneficial for the cover crop. But in this case where we have a high rainfall event, an El Nino type year that can be predicted, it might've been better if we'd have waited, probably would have been better if we'd have waited until the spring to apply that nitrogen. We wouldn't have lost that nitrogen. Uh, this past year, 2018, uh, this was the first year that the second planting date actually produced more biomass uh, than the first. And really we had a kind of a cool fall and it was kind of dry and we just didn't get a lot of uh, early season growth and it showed up here. Now it clearly distinguishes between the earlier planting dates and the later planting dates. That, that still holds true. Uh, and you also can see we had a little bit uh, not as consistent a nitrogen response but these are the kind of examples that we're talking about in the real world that we try to develop guidelines based off, off this information to help the growers. Now, everything that I've talked about up to this point has been managing the cover crop on the front end. Um, but what about on the back end where we get ready to terminate? Um, one of the things that's critical is you have, uh, cover crops actually produce a lot of growth in the, in the spring months. And this, this figure illustrates that. We have rye and wheat planted before corn, and then adjacent to that, we had rye and wheat planted before cotton. The only difference between these two uh, treatments, the before corn, we terminated the cover crop about mid-March, and then before cotton, we terminated it about mid-April. So that's only one month of growth on the cover crop, and you can see how much more biomass we actually was able to produce in that period of time. So this, uh, in some cases, it actually doubled. So if you think about it, when we're trying to produce high biomass levels and maximize the benefits associated with the cover crop, it can be as simple as planting as early as we can and terminating as late as possible. 
So far we've discussed the benefits of managing our cover crop to maximize the biomass. I would like to give you an example of that in the field to illustrate how management can actually affect the persistence of the cover crop in the field. The first example, let's start out with planting date one. That's the mid to late October. This was the one that produced the most biomass consistently over the four years of the study so far. If we take a look at the residue in between the crop rows, you can see a lot of residue is still present. So when we think about benefits associated with the cover crop that I mentioned earlier, such as erosion control, moisture conservation, weed suppression, you can see that this residue will provide benefits for a longer period of time throughout the growing season. Let's contrast the first planting date with the last planting date. This corresponds to early mid-December. If you recall, this produced the lowest amount of biomass averaged over the four years of the study. We can take a look at the residue that's left in between the crop rows and you can see that there's a lot of bare soil present. The residue decomposed very quickly because we have a climate in the southeast that produces high, high temperatures, high rainfall, high humidity that's going to decompose the residue very quickly. Therefore, that's why it's important to manage the cover crop for the most amount of biomass to help offset this climate. We recommend cover crops for the southeast, but we continue to conduct research to ensure that we maximize the biomass produced as cost effectively as possible. Preliminary results from this study indicate for winter cereal that we need to plant the cover as early in the fall as possible to maximize the biomass production. We can also apply at least 30 pounds of nitrogen to the acre to complement that biomass production even further. If you would like more information, please contact us at the National Soil Dynamics Laboratory.